think we are on. Okay, welcome everyone to the April Northwest C++ users group meeting. Uh, delayed three years getting into the reactor room, almost to this month. Um, going forward, we will be doing hybrid from here out. Uh, this was actually part of the plan before COVID hit. We're now realizing it. <laughs> Um, I just realized speaking through a mask is actually taking a little extra breathing, so that's new to me as well. Um, we do have three sponsors tonight I want to thank. First one is Microsoft for the room. Um, that will be going forward. Uh, you may have noticed we also now have a meetup group. So we'd like to check, uh, thank JFrog and Conan for sponsoring our meetup group. Thirdly, um, everybody knows we had kind of a door prize thing, right? And um, the door prize is a free pass to CPP North. Um, if you want to participate, we're going to do a raffle here in just a quick second. Um, no car value for the for the prize per se. You have to stay in the hotel that's designated for the conference. And I don't remember the conference dates off the top of my head. Um, that is sponsored by CPP North. Uh, Chris was going to be here to, to actually do that, but he got roped into another conference and he's speaking somewhere in the UK at the moment. Um, so what we'll do, uh, all the rules were online. Board members are not eligible. Sorry, folks. Um, how many people, so uh, given this is a, con the conference is in Toronto, Canada. Since the dates are July 17th through 19th. Thank you. July 17th through 19th. So how many people just by hand would be interested in going to CPP North for free? Is anybody? It needs to be mentioned mm -hmm. that if someone doesn't have US citizenship, then they will probably need some visa to Canada. That's good for you. Yeah. Okay. So we don't have any takers. <laughs> um, so if I generate a random number and put in zero, the answer is always zero. So we'll are done with that one. <laughs> Moving along to our featured guest tonight is Pete Williamson talking about remedial C++ 17 library features. And he has a plethora of slides. So I'm going to hand off to him. Howdy, everybody. My name is Pete Williamson. I'm your speaker for tonight. And tonight we're going to be talking about remedial C++. This is actually part two of remedial C++ 17. Part one was about the new features added to the language. Part two is about the new features added to the library. So tonight we're going to be talking about new features added to the standard library. I should point out that there's also a remedial C++ 14 and a remedial C++ 11 lecture in our Northwest CPP archive. So if you go to our YouTube channel and you want to learn more about older versions of C++, for the same reason we're talking about this tonight, that's certainly an option to you in some future days. So how did this come about? This came about because I work on the Chrome team, on the Chrome browser, and when C++ 11 came out, we couldn't actually use it for like five years. So five years later, finally all the compilers supported it, finally we could use it. It's like, okay, I better learn this. And as long as I'm learning it, I might as well teach other folks and bring them along with me. That's what I did, and then three years later, which was five years after the release of 14, I did it again for C++14, and now that it's been about five, six years since C++17 came out, I figure time cover C++17. And sure enough, two years from now, I expect Lloyd to call me and say, hey, what about C++20? All right, so one of the things I've discovered is that even though I have waited six years now to talk about C++17, not all the features are available everywhere yet. So I tried to compile some of these examples on my Mac using Mac CLang 14.0.3, which does not actually have parallel execution, which is part of the C++ library. Now, I expect it to take a while for language features to get in, but library features, they should just be able to take some code, right? But not there yet. Okay, uh, other things to mention. There's some advice from a guy named Andre, who used to be part of our group and has come here before, that you should know 10 times as much information as you're going to present. I did not follow that advice. <laughs> if I'm lucky, it's maybe one and a half, maybe two, and maybe even patchy in places. I'll do the best I can. 
The only reason I'm not calling that advice is not for disrespect from Andre, who I have a great deal of respect for, but because this takes a lot of time to prepare and I just didn't have enough time to learn 10 times as much as I needed to learn. Um, let's see, I want to make sure I give you time to read slides and digest. My manager tells me I talk way too fast when I'm presenting technical material. So feel free to raise your hand and slow me down if I'm ready to leave a slide after you've read the first one third of the slide or something like that. Also, if you want to ask some questions, please ask questions. Yes. Uh, what about this is remedial? <laughs> it implies we failed somewhere. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember back when I gave my remedial C++ 11 talk. I introduced it something as follows. Well, class, your managers have sent me here today because you've been using C++ in a rather antiquated way. <laughs> it's 2016 now. C++ 11 has been out for five years, and you're still using C++ 98. It's time to learn these features, class. <laughs> and that's how the first one got its name. I just sort of stuck with the name ever since. Any more questions? All right, once again, if there's questions, feel free to interrupt and ask as we go along. You don't need to wait till the end. Um, as I've mentioned already, there are 167 slides tonight. That gives you about 30 seconds per slide, and I've already spent three minutes on this one. <laughs> so we'll see how we go. And we started 10 minutes late. <laughs> this is also true. Let's see. That's the story of how I, how I wrote this. This is a high-level overview. I'm not going to go into all the weeds on every single feature. There just isn't time. There just aren't enough slides. If you want to learn more, may I recommend, I'll look for the camera to see, C++ 17, The Complete Guide by Nikolai M. Josudis. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name together to, to, correctly if you ever see this, Nikolai. I have nothing but respect for you, and I hope I got that right. But anyway, this book... The J is silent. Okay. This book covers everything you might need to know about C++ 17. That's just the deltas that C++ 17 brought along. Many of the examples have come from this book. Let's see... Okay, I think we are ready to start. Let's get going. So this is the book I just told you about. The Lloyd will post these slides online on our website, so you can go and get the slides if you want to follow this link to get the book. I'll point out that he also has a C++ 20 book, which I will start reading after this talk to prepare for my next talk in two years. Uh, the cool thing about this book is it's updated as it's getting written, so it's available in ebook format. But every time he adds something else to the book or makes any corrections, everybody who's purchased the ebook format gets an email and gets the new version of the ebook. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, as I've already mentioned, this is part two. This is where you find part one. And now it's time to talk about new library components. So, first of all, all my slides have tried to follow the same general template. So, for each feature, I'm going to tell you what it does. Hopefully, I'll simply explain the general idea. I'm going to give you an example, and any new code that's added with C++17 is going to be in purple. And I'll try to give you some wisdom about when to use it. I haven't used all these features myself, so in some cases I'm guessing. In some cases I will have nothing to say because I just don't know enough. <clears throat> so, first, standard optional. I realize this could be a very dry talk, so I tried to intersperse it with less dry pictures. <laughs> if you have any questions about what's that a picture of, ask me afterwards. I'll be happy to talk about it. General type. What does it do? Standard optional is a type that either does or doesn't contain a member of the template or doesn't contain the type key. So here's an example. You can use standard optional int, convert string to int, and then string. So if this succeeds, standard optional int will get an integer. If this fails, standard optional int will get nothing. So when would you use this? Well, right now what we do a lot of times is we'll return a null pointer if there's no value and an actual pointer to something if there is a value, which means you have to do a null check. So this is one way of not doing a null check, but then I will point out that the check for a standard optional being empty is a little bit more heavy weight than a null check. So you can avoid the dangers of null pointers by adding some extra code and some extra syntax and typing more characters, if you like that. You can use this whenever your function returns a value, or not. You can use this whenever you have an argument, or not. It can be safer and cleaner interface than throwing exceptions. When you're passing optional parameters, the fact the type of the parameter standard optional T makes it clear that the parameter is not required. 
But I wouldn't go overboard and I wouldn't replace every single new one in your code. I wouldn't go say, hey, this 100,000 line code base, we're going to refactor all so we don't have any more instances of null. All right, let's keep going. Standard variant. So what does it do? So you may have used some of the variants from Microsoft classes before, like I've used the MFC variants. I've used uh, variants in like ATL, the ActiveX template library, and things like that. This isn't quite the same in that this can't really contain anything. What it contains is one of a number of types specified at compile time. So here's an example. So this is a standard variant that contain either a string, a bool, or an integer. And then you can get by position number two, so that's position one, position two, I'm sorry, zero, one, two, of course it's zero based. If I try to get number two, I'll be trying to get an integer. Or you can say, I want to get an integer out, and I'll try to get an integer, and it will throw this error bad variant access is if that, there's an error. Instead of throwing the error, shouldn't it return an option type? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but then you have Maybe. to add the option type to your list of things. Maybe that makes the code a little bit more complicated because you have to check the option every single time. I didn't design this. So I'm just telling you how. Okay, I'm just curious. <laughs> All right, so why should you use standard variant? Uh, deserializing might be a good use case. It can allow you to have a collection of objects that don't necessarily derive from the same base class. I'm not sure what you would use that collection of uh, heterogeneous objects for, but you could do it. In my opinion, this is best avoided in case you really need it. So like any of the variant classes, it's harder to reason about if you don't really know the types. There will be times when you don't know the types and times when you absolutely need it, but other than that, I'll try to avoid this as much as possible. Question. Yes. Hi, if you have a code base that does not allow exceptions, which I think you do in the Google universe, uh, is this a reasonable way to return either a desired object or say an exception type to avoid throwing exceptions or is that not? So good? I would just not use this if I had an exception free code base. Okay. So yeah, generally an exception free code base, you're prohibited from calling anything that could possibly throw an exception. So we wouldn't just not call this. Yeah. Right, I'm not talking about actually throwing something. I'm talking about returning something that might have been thrown instead. So you have an object of that derives from exception, right? Return it rather than throwing it. Ah, I see. Uh, maybe I don't know. Okay, Robert. I didn't use C++ for a while. Uh, what is the advantage of variant over union? It's a similar idea done a C++ way with templates. It supports full C++ functionality for the members. Yeah. yeah. And it ensures that the correct destructors get called. Yeah. It's essentially a discriminated union is what it really so It's a union plus the type that's really in it. Type safety is the biggest reason. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So as you might guess by my opinion thing here at the bottom, I'm not a big fan of unions either. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Not my big fan of standard any for exactly the same reasons. So wait, any what? How is that different? Oh, my uh, pictures have been rickrolled. Okay. So how is this different than a variant? So an any is a variable that can hold any type. So this actually is like the old Microsoft Foundation classes variant. Uh, you can ask what type it has inside. You can only take out a value of that type. So here's an example of how you might use it. You can have variable one and just assign it something, maybe an int, variable two, just assign something else, maybe a string, and then you can check the type. And then if you get the types, then you can try and cast it to what you think it should be and print it. So that would be a pointer type internally? I would guess so, but I don't really know how it's implemented. Given that it's a library class, not a part of the language, I think your assertion that's a pointer type is exactly correct but it might be a reference of some kind, which are really pointers, but that's another story. <laughs> so when would you use it? Maybe you have a container of mixed types. Again, I don't know why you would have a container of mixed types, but maybe you do. Maybe you're deserializing data, which is sort of similar to our use case for variant. So like variant, I would say, that I think this makes the code harder to reason about. I recommend minimizing its use to where you absolutely need it. 
Okay, standard byte. So this is a new type to represent a byte. Now, it's interesting to note that it hasn't actually been hard coded to eight bits, but it can understand, it can use whatever the machine's architecture uses for a byte. So it's implemented as an EDOM using unsigned character underneath. So here's an example of how to use it. So you just declare something as standard byte, and you can pass in the hex value of the byte. You can do like shift equals operations on it, and when to use it. I would say that if you have raw data, that's machine data underneath, this is a better fit than using unsigned character. It turns out to actually use unsigned character underneath, so performance-wise there's no difference, but as far as the declarative power of your code and communicating to the person that reads it, who may be you six months from now, I think this does a better job of describing what it is you're trying to do. Robin. Uh, I heard a definition of a byte uh, as, uh, as the smallest addressable memory cell. Mm -hmm. So if the smallest addressable memory cell is 16 bit, then the byte is 16 bit on that architecture. Right. That, and, and this is the difference from the types based on char, which are always one. Size, size of char or unsigned char or assigned char is always one as opposed to byte. And byte might be one or two or, or more. I see. Yes. Really? Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I think another <laughs> note there was, I think it was Fairchild had a processor out at one point that um, uh, had a unit or a unit size of 12 bits. So it's been run into weird things like that. Too. A friend of mine used to work on typewriters for Olivetti and other companies, which had all sorts of non standard bit sizes mm -hmm. and had to have special versions of C compilers. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Whoops, that was too fast. Standard string view. So what is a string view? Well, it's a lot like a standard string that doesn't own its own memory. So how do you make sure that the memory doesn't get released at the wrong time? By careful programming. <laughs> so it's read only. They're not null terminated. They have a set length that it contains as part of the string view. This can be really good for memory map files or very large blocks of memory. They're very cheap and easy to pass around. So here's an example of using a string view. So in this case, we're going to make a string view called greetings, and here's the string that it's going to refer to, which should be used at compile time. So Robin, you're trying to tell me something about the mouse, but I don't quite get it. Uh, the online viewers don't see where you're pointing at. You ah, I see. use the mouse. All right, let's try to do that then. So yeah, my normal inclination is to stand up and point for the people in the room, but let's use the mouse here. Okay, online viewers, uh, please say yes if you can see the mouse. Yes. All right, great. So in this case, readings is owned as a static at the file level and shouldn't get deleted until the program is done. But there might be other things that are generated by new. You'll have to make sure they stay alive. And you can pass in standard string views to some program that's going to use them without ever touching the allocator to free the memory. Let me get my pointer back to the screen. So there are some dangers to using string view. You've got to make sure the memory stays allocated for as long as a string view could possibly access it, especially if the string view gets copied or what if the string view gets copied to another thread. So the programmer has the work cut out for them. Um, it's dangerous to return a string view from a function that created something. It's dangerous to use with auto because you may not realize you're getting a string view. You may think you're getting a string and getting your own copy. Having said this, uh, over the code base of my particular company, there are quite a number of string views in use. I think they're liked primarily because they're very cheap to pass around. So, so I don't know why they're not passing around string references, but they really do like string views. Walter. I'm a little uh, puzzled about the dangerous to use with auto. Does that mean uh, because auto disappears at the end of a scope, what's the danger in that when it's a read only? Or so what auto says is what type is this? So you may be assuming when you look at auto in the- Oh, code, I see what you mean. It's okay. a different type than a string view. All right. Okay, any more questions? The important thing to know yes. is that string view follows value semantics. Yes. So you pass it as, a, as an inch. Yes, thanks for pointing that out. Let's continue. Okay, suffix V for type traits. <laughs> 
But first, uh, what was a type trait again? I knew that I knew that once upon a time. Once I picked up the books, like, yeah, I, I read all through the Android's book about type traits 15 years ago, and I don't remember any of it. Let's do just a quick refresh on what type traits are and why you might want to use them in case, like me, you don't remember, or in case you haven't learned it yet. So think of a trait as a small object whose main purpose is to carry information used by another object or algorithm to determine policy or implementation details from this guy named Yarna, who you probably heard of at this point. Uh, templates that are not part of the class provide a consistent interface for other templates to use. This is what type traits are. So if you're declaring a class somewhere, you might, in addition to the class, declare several type templates, which may or may not be declared in the same class as the template to tell you things about this particular type. Let's look at a little bit deeper. So traits are templates that can help other templates answer questions about the type T. So if you're using a template, to write generic code, you can make some reasoned behaviors about what you can and cannot do with the type that has been passed in. So traits often use specialization or partial specialization to distinguish between different types of T. So let's give an example here. So we're going to declare our class foo. You're going to point with your mouse? Say, oh, right, right. Point with the mouse. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I appreciate the uh, correction. For video recording purposes also. Yes. All right. So looking here, um, we can call the is floating point template and notice that it, um, or the is floating point trait class, passing it an object foo, and we can look at the value, and this should return a true or a false, depending whether it's floating point. Now for built-in types, such as float and int, those uh, traits have already been declared. For our type class type foo, we're going to have to write a little template somewhere that's a specialization of standard is floating point for foo and then turn either true or false depending whether we think it should be a um, floating point or not. In this case, I think my class should probably not be floating point, so I'd write something to return false. Walter. Where's the underscore V? We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> I'm going into the pre-information you need to know before telling what underscore V All right. is. And also motivating why underscore V might be a good idea. Okay. <laughs> yeah, note you've got to say standard colon colon is floating point foo colon colon value to find out whether you've got a true or a false. All right, so let me bring my pointer back so I can advance the next slide. Now, suffix V for type traits. You notice that those type traits ended with colon colon value. A shortcut to this is just to use underscore V instead. So the C++11 way is to say standard is pointer of T value. C++17 way is to say standard pointer underscore V. So basically, this is just saving you some typing, nothing more, nothing less. A little bit of syntactic sugar to make your life hopefully a little bit sweeter. Oh, what value does it return if it's not a pointer? It's either true or false. False. Yeah. Um, like true or false, or is this? There is a template specialization to return false under normal cases, and then there are specializations for pointers that return true. So if you okay. have a T star and that rule matches, then it will return true. I guess I just, I, I don't even understand why there's a colon colon value there if it's only true or false. If it is pointer, why wasn't that? Sufficient. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I haven't shown you the underlying mechanics of how you build the type templates. So inside the type templates, you're going to have a value called value. So you're declaring like this little bitty template in class, which has a value called value, which you will set to true or false when you are doing the override. Okay. So as I said, sorry, I'm doing this at a very high level, eliding lots of details. That was one of the details I chose to elide. To try to keep this talk in an hour and a half, we will see if it was successful or not. <laughs> okay. I'll be patient. <laughs> I assume it returns true only for the raw pointers, not for the smart pointer. Uh, it depends on how the smart pointers are overridden with the type traits. So if the type trait declaration for the smart pointer decides to return true, then it would return true. But if it's in standard, it's defined already. Yes, it's already defined. I don't actually know how it's defined. Yeah. So remember I said I know maybe twice as much, but not 10 times as much. That's one of the pieces of information I did not get during my research. <laughs> right. Okay, 
Any more questions before we go on? Let's keep moving. So when should we use suffix V? I am personally going to recommend suffix V. I think it makes your code easier to read and easier to reason about. So I think it's a great idea and I would definitely use it whenever writing new code. Okay, next, <coughs> new type trees that have been added. Something a little off about this type later. Anybody guess what it is? Not enough keys. <laughs> not enough. Uh, yeah, not enough. Not enough. Yeah. <laughs> no numbers. No numbers. But actually, this typewriter is made out of Lego. Six <laughs> Yeah, this is a Lego typewriter kit. And if you press any one of the keys, the center hammer will come up, but none of the other hammers move at all. <laughs> it took me a while looking at realize, Wait a second. That doesn't look quite right. And you start seeing little studs on the front. Yeah, it's a one bit typewriter. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so new type traits. So, given we know what type traits are now and why you might want to use them, C17 decided to add a whole bunch of new ones to make it easier for you to write your templates that have to treat things in generic ways and have to ask questions about the type that was passed into them. So, I'm not going to name them all. So, these are some of the ones you get. But wait, there's another page. <laughs> But wait, there's another page, and this one has types called conjunction, disjunction, negation, which you can use to combine several type traits. So if the question you want to ask, is this a pointer and referenceable or something like that? But wait, there's a few more types. Oh, no, I'm sorry. These are examples. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of defining the type trait. This is just an example of using the type trait. So if you call is swappable with int comma int, you should expect it to return false. But if it's int reference, you should expect it to return true. Okay, one other example, and you'll see that we're actually using the uh, underscore v suffix here, is you might want to know if something invocable. So there are several different ways to invoke things. There's operator, there's lambdas, there's classes that support certain things. And this one should return if it's invocable. Okay, next, parallel STL algorithms. So before C17, C17 didn't really contain much in the way to help you if you wanted to write some parallel or heavily parallel code. If you wanted to take a whole horde of processors and put them to work on a task, it was pretty much up to you or you had to find some library somewhere that did it. And there were libraries, Microsoft had the task parallel library, although that was really meant more for C Sharp than C++, I think it just sort of happened work for C++, if I remember correctly. Um, and I'm not sure they worked on every OS. And typically, you only use it for very, very large tasks. So C++ has added some new algorithms. Uh, once again, I'm not going to mention all of the names of the different parallel algorithms they've added, just to show you that we have quite a few. Oh, wait. We have more algorithms that have also been modified to have parallel versions and more modified parallel algorithms. So as you can tell, C++ 17 has added a whole bunch. There's also the new parallel STL algorithms. So I mentioned I was using uh, Macintosh Clang 14.0.3. It turns out they don't actually support, I'll use my mouse over here. They don't actually support this part, the standard execution header yet. So even though it is now 2023, not all parts of C++ 17 are available everywhere, which is why I said earlier that I wasn't so worried about being in time for C++ 23. It just means you're going to have to do an update when they finally get execute, you know, finally come in. It's like, you know, it's a remedial C++ of the possible C++. <laughs> <laughs> well, instead of remedial C++, universal. it'll be universally possible. <laughs> Remedial C++ updates, remedial C++ modified, something like that. We'll see. Yep. Okay. I'll get back with you in 2024. <laughs> I'll get back with you in a year or so and ask me if it works. All right, so when should you use these STL parallel algorithms? The short answer is measure, measure, measure. So if you're doing something, a big task 10 times, almost certainly not. If you're doing a big task 100 times, almost certainly not. A thousand times? Probably still not. 10,000 times, maybe. A million times, we'll probably see a speed up. So it depends on what you're doing and just how big the task is. I'm imagining a reasonably small task, but 
whatever you're going to do, measure before you decide this is a great idea. So when should you use these FSL algorithms? Let's see. I mentioned that they're not available on all platforms yet. And I mentioned that you needed to measure. All right, let's move on. Standard for each N. So this is going to do a for each, but it's only going to operate on the first N elements. So it's sort of like if I know I want to use just the first 10 elements of this collection, but I don't want to write if I equals one to 10, I want to have something more generic, then this function is for you. I should also note the word there's a copy N, generate N, and fill N provided to you by the new version of C, well, new version of C++. <laughs> So here's an example using for each n. So what I've done is I've declared a vector of fruits. Apple, banana, cherry, durian, and I actually read in Wikipedia that eggplant was a fruit. I'm not sure I read correctly, but that's what I saw. So it's going oh, yeah. in here. And seeds. Okay. So we'll have a standard string fruits I like, and I'll do a for each n from fruits beginning at the start and going to the third element and I will add that to the list of fruits that I like. And then for my second one, I'll do a for each n, starting at begin plus three, I'll take the next two, and we'll add those to uh, fruits I don't like, or fruits I don't want. All right, bring my pointer back, and off we go. Wait, did that, there was an example, there was no y to use. Okay, so I missed that one. I should have had a slide saying when you would use it, and I completely recommend this. I think it's fine to use. So whenever it would make your code look better, as I often say in most of the other slides. Okay, the next one, standard reduce, which is a parallel friendly algorithm. There's parallel versions of this available. So it's a parallel friendly way to sum up a big list of values or to act upon a big list of values accumulating the result. So in this case, we can have a big vector called data I like calling my vectors data until they're proven otherwise. And we can pass in a starting value and then how we want to combine them. In this case, I've chosen standard multiply. So I'll be multiplying them all together. So when to use, I'd say it's especially useful for combining results of parallel algorithms, which is why it's important that it's parallel friendly. Okay, transform functions. I don't know how many of you watch Robotech. That is a VF1 fighter which transforms between mode with arms and legs and mode where it's a fighter and mode where it's a giant robot. That's how I got picked for this slide. So there's transform reduce, which is just like reduce, but it applies a transform first. So if you want to process a whole bunch of data in a similar way and do something complicated, a transform is almost always what you want. They're very powerful, they can do a lot. I haven't actually needed to use them because I'm mostly connecting Gazinta's in one layer of the big layer stack to Gazelta's in another layer of the big layer stack. But if you're doing lots of heavy, heavy lifting data processing, this could be exactly what you want. So here's an example of standard transform reduce. So we'll call transform reduce, pass in a pair of beginning and end for the range. We'll give it an initial value and then a lambda down at the bottom that was, is what we want to call. When to use it? Um, I'd say it's also useful for parallel operations. There's a different version of transform reduce that takes two different ranges. So you can have both an input range and an output range. Is that correct? No, something is wrong. Sorry, I've missed something somewhere. Oh, that's right, this one doesn't have an output range. It just computes a value for you. And then this one, puts the values that it computes into the output range. Okay, similarly, we've got an inclusive scan, exclusive scan. So imagine you've got a big long block of data and you wanna scan your way all across the big long block of data. So here's an example of using inclusive scan. So the difference between inclusive scan and exclusive scan is the first and last elements. You could either be inclusive or exclusive with them. Other than that, they operate exactly the same. So if you had a standard inclusive scan of this particular vector and you pass it the begin and the int and an outstream iterator that would, after things had been included with each other, um, 
give you an output, then this is the output you would get. So it's like underneath there is a reduce operation going on, adding them together. So that's why you don't see the add. Okay, bring my pointer back. And so as I said, inclusive scan excludes the first value, exclusive scan does not, but that means you're gonna need an initial value for an exclusive scan. It needs to know what do I start at. I don't have any guidance because I've never needed to use any of these. So you're on your own, sorry. Transform inclusive scan. Remember how I said transforms make everything more powerful? What if you have the same thing, but you could call an extra function? So this, you can provide a sequence that might look like this. There'd be the initial value and then the function of the first thing. And then there'd be a function of the initial value with the function of, or the, with the same function of the unary functions on the two first things, and the sequence will continue in this way. So it's sort of calling the transform and summing things up or multiplying things up, whichever you choose to do. So here's an example of how you might call transform exclusive scan. So once again, you have data range for the input, a data range for the output, the binary operator you want to use, the B in that last function, and the unary operator you want to use, the F in the last slide, and the initial value to start with. Robin. Can you show the previous slide, please? Absolutely. Uh, I apologize. Let me know if I'm going through these too fast. In the last line, I see two letters B. Is that that's correct? Accident or intentional? No, that's intentional. So it's basically like rolling up from one end. It's going to grab the first thing, call a function on it. Grab the next thing, call a function on it. It's going to combine those two with the combining function. Then that's going to get combined with the combining function of the unary function called the next element. And then that whole thing is going to get wrapped up and it continues that way. Okay. And it's going to continue to build a sequence for you. Okay. So having said that, you will probably not wonder why I really don't have any good idea what you would use this for or when you use it. <laughs> so I'm sorry I can give you no good options for when you might need this. Walter. Uh, something occurs to me, uh, we're, we're seeing as these slides progress, more and more combinations of lower level operations with a new name. Doesn't that imply kind of a lack of composability of the lower operations, why do you need a special function to compose them? Possibly, my guess is they wanted to add syntactic sugar for those people for whom composing it was something they did often. So maybe there's some group of people in some numeric processing regime that does stuff like this all the time, and a little bit of syntactic sugar makes their life easier. But having said that, I'm only guessing I don't know the answer. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's move along. String searches. <laughs> so what string searches are is a way to search for a string very quickly in a very long selection of text. So what this means is at last the C++ standard library gets a Boyer Moore string search, which if you've ever had occasion to want one, is a very fast way of searching for a string inside a large body of text. So here's an example of how you might use it. You would call string search, pass in the text begin, the text end, pass in the searcher you want. In this case, it's the Boyer Moore searcher. There's also Boyer Moore horse pool. I'm not quite sure the correct pronunciation of that searcher. And with a Boyer Moore searcher, you pass in the beginning and the end of the string you want to find. So here's a couple more search for examples. So you could just call standard search, not the Boyer Moore searcher, and pass it the text you're looking through and the text you want to find. And you can even call it in parallel, unless you're, of course, on my Macintosh until the next version <laughs> comes out. <clears throat> so it's also noticed, it's also notable to say that they can be used on things other than strings. Yes? What gets returned from these functions? Uh, let me back up a little bit. In this case, a position. So that position is a integer index into the first text body. Okay. 
And you can use predicates to customize the search. So once again, I forgot to add a slide that says when you would use this. Um, I'm totally in favor of it. I've had to use Boyer Moore search before. It's awesome. It's uh, much faster than other ways. So when you want to search a really large body of text, I thoroughly recommend these methods. Okay, general utility functions. So there's general utilities, size, empty, data, as const, clamp, and sample, which we'll go through. So standard size, as you might expect, gives you the size of the container. So for a standard vector here, you can call standard size on it, it would tell you how many objects are in the standard vector. Now, sometimes you don't know whether you're being passed a collection or an array as a parameter. You might want to call one method as collection and a different method as an array. So the nice thing about standard size is it will give you the right answer, whichever one you pass in. So the big reason you might want to use this is when you don't know what you're going to get. Does it return the size in bytes? Um, no, it returns the size in elements. Number of elements? Yes. So for an array, is it similar to a uh, array divided by array sub zero? Yes, it's similar to that. Similar to that. Oh. Or if you have vectors like vector dot length, it's similar to that. So we'll call the right thing depending on what you have. Okay. Okay, standard empty, pretty obvious. It lets you know if a collection is empty. So I'd say this is good for a container, a raw array, or an initializer list. So even if you just have C++ initializer list, which is a type initializer list, this will give you the right answer. Standard data. So I really wanted a picture of the next generation data, but all those pictures seem to be copyrighted. We're putting this up on YouTube, so I didn't want to include a copyrighted picture here. So this is a nice picture of some cherry blossoms in Kirkland earlier this week. <laughs> <laughs> so standard data, what it does is it's a good way to get access to the raw data underneath the collection. So if you have a standard vector and you want to treat it as an array, standard data can help you out. And here's some examples of some code to do that. When would you use it? When you need to get the underlying data and you want to process it with array syntax. Okay, standard as const. This is my favorite source of all constants, CRC <laughs> mathematical tables. The rubber Bible. Exactly. So what does it do? It converts a value to const. Before, we were converting a value to const with uh, a static cast. So just static cast? No, it was const cast. Sorry, I think yeah. that's an error in my slide. So I will fix that when it goes up. It would be static const, because const cast, const oh, uh, cast away the const. Ah, uh, you're right, you're right, okay. Thank you for pointing that out. So not an error on my slide after all, but I wasn't quite smart enough to realize that. <laughs> okay, so if you have a function that takes both a const parameter or there's a const overload and there's a non-const overload, you wanna make sure the const overload gets called. That's what this was written for. So you can make sure that the compiler thinks that parameter is const and calls the const overload of the function. And here's an example of how you might do that. So up here we have a function that takes a non-const overload a function takes a const overload, a vector of some data, we're calling standard as const data, and that will force the const overload to be called. Why not just use the cast? Um, I don't have a good answer for you there. I personally, well, why don't we get to the next slide? Oh, you, you don't need I'm not sure about this. <laughs> it's nice syntactic sugar, but I like being able to search for all casts with underscore cast. So I don't actually recommend this one because I like being able to search for the casts. That was one of the nice things they did in C++ is got rid of the parentheses cast operator, yeah. which was sort of hard to spot when you're looking at code. I don't know. I like this because it really says what it's doing. Okay. So I guess the answer then is expressive power for some. They say it's better expressive power than the cast. Personally, I'm going to go with the cast. Have you ever needed, really needed to spot all, this, all the places where the casting is used? Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll tell this, the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> the reason number of years back, it's if you're uh, doing a code review, every explicit cast is a potential bug. 
Okay, so the casts, you need them to stand out so you can pay attention to them when you're doing a code review. That's why. But have you ever needed to find casts where you add const to the same type? Generally, you're more worried about casts where you're casting away const or changing types than when you're making something const. So just the same, it's sort of nice to have them all together. I'll get to you in just a second, a quick story first. A number of years ago, I worked for a company, I think Microsoft it was, and they were doing a um, security upgrade of all of their products. They, they had decided it was time to get religion on security. We want to make everything as secure as we can. We want to get rid of buffer overflows, fix a lot of other issues. And right then, it was very nice to be able to do a search for every underscore cast in my code base and check them all out from a security point of view, which I still like to do from time to time is go back, search for all the casts, and make sure that they're still good and see if I can get rid of some. So, sorry, you had something you want to say? The one thing I want to say is S const is, make, is opposite pattern because S const is making the thing that's being passed const, which is safer. So you shouldn't have to move away from S const. Yeah. Generally. Okay. Right. Yeah. And also you don't need to specify the type, which is error prone. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so your, your point is taken. I may still stick with underscore cast myself just because I like being able to search for all of them. But I can understand why you might want to do otherwise. Yeah. And so in that regard, using reinterpret cast is always preferable to using the parenthesized cast casting. Absolutely. But every use of reinterpret cast, you should strive to get rid of if you can. <laughs> All right, next, standard clamp. And as you can guess, what it's going to do is it's going to take an integer or a value and clamp it between a lower bound and an upper bound. So it's fairly easy. In this case, we'll clamp the year between 1985 and 2023. So if a year is not between those values, it'll be moved up. If it needs to be moved into the range, it'll be moved down. If it needs to be moved into the range. And you could also call a comparison function to use. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a less than or greater than thing. It could say if this comparison function doesn't produce a value, at least min val, or produces a value greater than max val, then to move the thing that we are clamping. So when would you use this? I would say if your code was already doing this the hard way, standard clamp is a much more expressive and easy way to read than doing it the hard way. Having said that, I wouldn't go refactor my entire code base to use standard clamp just because it's there. So does it sort of like trims the value to a certain yeah. range? Yeah. It will return a value that is within the range. I don't think it will necessarily change the variable that you pass in. Okay, standard sample. So this is going to randomly pick a sample of n items from a data set, preserving the order. So if you have to do some kind of random, random sampling for a numerical algorithm you're doing, this might just be your cup of tea. So here's an example of how you might use it. Let's say we have a vector of data, which I all have in order, and we're going to do a sample between the beginning and the end. We're gonna put them into an output iterator. I'm gonna choose, in this case, exactly three um, samples. And then we'll choose a random engine we want to use to pass into it. In this case, for example, the output iterator might get 2, then 13, then 55. Notice that the order is stable. Order is always stable. Is that what you mean? So when you call this function, the things that you see in the output iterator will be in the same order they appeared in the input iterator. That's selected randomly. Yes. So they'll be selected randomly, but they will be in the same order. So this could definitely be useful in numeric applications. Having said that, I've never written any such numeric applications, so I can't give you perfect guidance for it. And there might already be a statistics library using this providing this, in which case you might not need it. But if not, could be helpful. Let's see, I already mentioned the stable order. Next, we're going to talk about node handles. So what are node handles, you might ask? Let's say you've got a node, let's say you've got a C++ map, and the map has a whole bunch of nodes inside of it. And what you have to do now, if you want to change the key of a certain value, is you have to take the thing out of the map, change the key, and then reinsert the thing into the map. Wouldn't it be nice if you could uh, change the key in place? That's what node handles are going to allow you to do. It can also allow you to merge two maps or unordered sets. So in this case, we have a standard map. Um, we'll put life at four, universe at eight, everything at 10, and meaning at seven. 
But meaning was not supposed to be seven. Meaning was supposed to be 42. <laughs> so we're going to extract the one at seven. We're going to change the key to 42. We're going to insert that. And there we are, change thing in the map without having to extract and reinsert. What is the state of the map in between the extract and the insert? Um, so you know, I may have misspoken. I think the extract is actually going to pull it out. Okay, so if I tried to query seven if after I called seven, the extract, it would be there. Two, During that window, you would get nothing. And here's an example of merging two maps. So we have on top a map of C++ versions. On the bottom, we have a map of new versions. And I'm going to merge new versions into versions. So basically merging two maps together with one single C++ call. What if the end result repeated? Sorry, what is the end result here? So the end result is going to be a single map with all the entries of both the first map and the second map. So in, in the result, there will be the repeated entries. Oh, there are repeated entries. I mean, if in one map and in another map, the entry is identical, there will be two in the result. So may I refer you to the book, The Complete C++ <laughs> by Nikolai Yasudis? Um, actually, I remember reading the answer to that, but I don't remember what it was. So I'll go back to my statement at the beginning about not knowing 10 times as much as I need to, but maybe one and a half. And that was not part of the uh, things that I remembered. So as everyone remember, map is, has uh, non-repeating values and multi-map has might have repeating yeah. values. Mm -hmm. right. and, and that's why merge will be different for map and multi-map. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, any other questions on node handles? Just that I have done exactly that the hard way. <laughs> so it's nice to have language support. Nice. Yeah, well, I've done it already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it would have been nice to have language would support. Would have been nice. It's, it's curious, what if one map has, one map and another map has the same key, but different values associated with the key? What, what's going to be with that? Uh, once again, I'll refer you to the book. I remember reading the answer, but I don't remember what it was. In my example case, I had something else that I did in that case. Thankful. <laughs> <laughs> that could work. You fill them out. <laughs> so when would you use node handles? They're useful for renaming keys, for merging maps, or for moving a large node between similar containers. Okay, making in place better. So I don't know if you ever read about a book. There's a book called The Great Good Place. It talks about how I'll have a first place, which is work, a second place, which is home, but we all need a third place where we can be our true self. So generally he talks about bars, but these folks up in Bothell made a bookstore based on the idea of that book, which they called third place books. So it could be a third place for people to be. We're talking about M place, not third place. It's just a uh, very similar titles. So that's how the picture came here. <laughs> so making in place better. So in place now returns a reference, which it didn't before. Try in place will guarantee to move the value only if there's no element there yet. So it will fail if there's already an element there. And insert or assign guarantees to move the value either a new or existing element. Let's take a look at a quick example. So here we're calling try in place. So once again, we're going to try and move meaning to slot 42, which will work if and only if 42 is not already assigned. And throw otherwise? Uh, I believe. I don't remember if it throws or fails. Oh, it would it turn. With the word try, I would assume it's. It throws. I think like, you're probably right. That would be too like easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're probably right, but I would check the uh, reference to make sure before writing code based on that assumption. Okay. My understanding was that the prefix try always intentionally to avoid throwing. If if it, if it failed, then it didn't throw, just return something. In otherwise, every time I see it, that returns a bull. Yeah. Really? And if it were just in place. Then that might throw. That might throw yeah. Okay, if somebody wants to do a quick search on try and place and see whether it throws or returns something, <laughs> let everybody know. Uh, right now, I'm going to continue the presentation, just pop up when you've got an answer. Okay. So here's an example of using insert or assign. So in this case, we would insert 42 if it wasn't there and assign 42 if it was already there. So uh, when do we use it in place improvements? So basically, these are just shortcuts for code we already write. 
there are slightly more intentful way to express our intentions. So I wouldn't necessarily go through and rip out code that already been written to replace it with this. But when you're writing new code, if you want to use a syntactic sugar, by all means go ahead, it's expressive, so it's reasonably good. Okay, next we're gonna talk about incomplete types and containers. So what does this mean? So right now, a vector, let's see. No, let's go to the next slide. So right now, if you want to write, I'm sorry, before C++ 17, if you want to write a type node that has a vector of nodes as descendants, you couldn't actually write it because the type is not complete at the time you're trying to define it. You have to use some other strategy. So this scenario has now been explicitly allowed. So we're creating a container of type a vector of node, but vector of node hasn't been totally defined at the point that it's declared when we're using it. As far as when to use, as I said, it was designed specifically for nodes that contain lists of themselves, and that's when I would use it. So this is, I'm sorry, this is a language, or this is a, a library. This is a library feature, not a language feature. Not a language feature. Right. Everything we're talking about tonight is a library feature. Wow. Yep, you can do a lot of great stuff with a library. Any other questions? All right. Standard scope lock. So we use scoping for locks all the time with uh, RAII. I hope I remembered that right. Yes, I did remember that right, programming. I keep getting it mixed up with the Recording and Association Industry of America. So. Um, before this, we could use standard lock guard, but it only supported one. Scope lock will support more than one lock at the same time. So for instance, you could do a standard scope lock and pass in mutex1 and mutex2, and then when it exits, both mutexes will get unlocked. So once again, syntactic sugar for something we could have done before makes it a little, little nicer, a little bit better. Much more than that, because, because uh, trying to lock two different mutexes is one of the ways you can get into deadlock if you lock them, lock them in one order in one place and a different order in the other place. I suspect what this does is make sure that they're in a consistent order. Okay. No, you are absolutely right, and I've forgotten that. Thank you for pointing that out. So, when would you use standard scope lock? Once again, whenever I'm doing RAII, so resource acquisition is initialization. And once again, there's a little bit of added complexity here and some syntactic sugar. So, what I said is that the added complexity to learn with the additional value that sugar provides. I was going to say it's up to you, but after what Bob has said, I think I'll say it seems like a really good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, is always lock free. So what this does is it checks whether a type is atomic based on whether the type can always be used without locks. Let's look at an example here. So we've got a const expert, and if it is always lock free, then we take the lock free path. If it might be locking or might not be atomic, then we can take a different path. So when would you use this? Uh, before this, we did this kind of thing using macros. So by making it part of the language, or at least part of the library, we gave the ability to be a little bit more safe and better support substitution failure is not an error when you're writing templated code. Um, should I explain what substitution failure is not an error is, or is most people remember that? I just remember, just wish somebody would remind me how to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> Finna. No. <laughs> I always never know. Yeah, I can never, they've got a name for it. I can never uh -huh. remember it. <laughs> if I watched more C talks in the CPP time, perhaps I would know. All right, standard shared mutex. So, what this is on some platforms, if the mutex doesn't support timed locks, it can be a little bit more efficient. And in the book and other places, they go into like exactly which platforms and what circumstances it applies. I'm trying to give you a high-level overview, so I'm going to gloss over those tonight. So shared mutex was added to complement timed mutex. So here's an example of how you might use it. So you've got a shared mutex, and then if you're reading, you can do a shared lock on that mutex, and you can safely read, and here's a writing sample. So when to use this? It's good for platforms where you need more efficiency than standard times mutex provides you. And good, good for use with a multiple reader single writer case. 
All right, cache line sizes. Sometimes you have to think about what the cache line size is to do good programming. So this lets the programmer adjust to the cache line size of the current processor as is best known by the library. So this is not going to actually query the processor and find out, but the library and the compiler that you're using, whatever they know about the processor is what will get used. So if you have some knowing better, like knowing know the cache line size is exactly 128 and that's what we're gonna code for, you can make a number of 128 and you can use that. But if you don't know, you've got some constants, hardware destructive interference size and hardware constructive interference size. Okay, those, that's big words, what do they mean? So the hardware destructive interference size is the recommended minimum offset between two objects that might be accessed by different threads. So if you're worried about different threads doing cache contention and you wanna keep things further apart, you wanna make sure you use the hardware destructive interference size. The hardware constructive interference size is for the same thread. So the recommended maximum size of, two contig of contiguous memory within which two objects are placed in the same L1 cache line. I understand when we have a large array and we want multiple threads to operate on it, we should separate that array into the threads based on the destructive yeah. interference size. Um, yes, based on the destructive size. I see. So here's an example of how you might use it. So what we're doing it here is we're using a value inside an align as statement in the first case. And the second case, we're going to assert that our data is smaller than or equal to the constructive interference size. So this seems very useful in writing very performant multi-threading code where you have to take the architecture into account. And once again, as I mentioned earlier, this is compiler's best guess based on the platforms. If you know better for a specific processor, use that number instead. By the, by the way, folks, if Fridor Prius, I believe you it has a book that talks about this in a lot of detail, and there was a talk at CppCon last year that was absolutely wonderful on this topic. Awesome, thanks for letting us know. All right, uncaught exceptions. Not to be confused with uncaught exception, which already exists. So what is this? When you're doing the resource acquisition as initialization cleanup, this lets you find out if there are any exceptions propagating up and how many exceptions are propagating up so you can clean up better. So unlike the older deprecated standard uncut exception, notice no S, the new function is going to return the number of outstanding exceptions. So here's an example of how you might call it. So if standard uncut exceptions is greater than the number of exceptions I already know about, then a new one's been thrown while I was trying to clean up, and then it tells me to clean up the current object too in addition to things that I'm already cleaning up and then finish cleaning up. Otherwise, we can commit changes to the current object and continue cleaning up the other objects. So this is something that you would only use inside an exception handler, not in normal code. So when would you use this? Basically, if you're expecting nested exceptions and you want to recover cleanly, this will be a good way to, a good thing to know about as you're cleaning up. Okay, improvements to shared pointers. So what it does, it does special handling for arrays. So you can already use shared pointers for an array that called delete, the array version of delete. But now some new syntax sugar makes it a little bit easier and I'll show you how. So now you can call the thing on top, whereas before you had to call the thing on bottom. Notice the part in orange on the bottom, you no longer have to supply. So before you were supplying the custom deleter for the shared pointer when you constructed it, which was an array deleter. Now it understands that it's an array and will automatically route things to the array deleter for you. So once again, a little bit of syntactic sugar. A second thing, a second improvement to shared pointers is there's a new cast type, reinterpret pointer cast. It keeps ownership, but changes the type of the pointer. So for example, if we had a shared pointer of type U, which was foo, then we could reinterpret that to be a type T, which is maybe a base class of U, for instance. A third thing, a third improvement to shared pointers is that shared pointers, shared pointers now provide a weak member type. So if we want to get a weak pointer, 
from the shared pointer, we can do that using the weak pointer, which returns a weak type of the pointer T. Number four, weak from this, lets you use the this pointer to get a new weak pointer to use. So does everybody know what a weak pointer is and why you would use it? Yeah. Okay, seems like people generally know. If somebody's watching this talk later on YouTube and doesn't know, then I recommend looking up weak pointers and trying to figure out why you might use one. Quick typo, right. quick typo in the slide, C, C plus plus one. <laughs> um, Should be 11. It's 17 or 11. <laughs> Yes, I think you are absolutely right, and I will fix that title in the slides before you post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> I reviewed these slides three or four times, but obviously not quite enough. Okay, so here's an example from the book. You've got a person, which is new person. We're going to make a shared pointer from that person, and then we're going to get a weak pointer to the person that will observe what the smart pointer owns. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> now you lost me. Weak pointer observes ownership of what SP, the smart pointer owns, or the shared pointer owns. So basically it's a weak pointer to the thing the shared pointer is pointing to. But that, oh, okay, I get it, okay. okay. I think this slide should mention that person is deriving from enable shared from this. Um, yes, you're right. Probably should. So thank you for that. I will try and update my slides to mention that in case anyone looks at these slides later. The one problem I had to deal with is I can only fit so many lines of code at this point size. So I, I've lighted a lot of stuff that would help make the examples easier to understand. But I think in this case, perhaps you're right in the rating too much. So when would I use them? Uh, generally, I try to avoid shared pointers whenever possible. There are some times when you need them. Um, if you do need to use shared pointers, these are good. But my first piece of advice would be see if you can write your code so you don't need a shared pointer. OK, there's some new special math functions. Cool. So. We've got, first of all, some new functions for greatest common denominator, least common multiple. Yeah. There's a new overload of standard hypotenuse that takes uh, three arguments. So if you're computing a point in three space and want to compute distance, it's very helpful for doing that. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's more numeric functions. Once again, I'm not going to read them all. Good. So for elliptic intervals. But wait, there's more. There's oh, Laguerre yeah. functions and Legendre functions a Riemann zeta function. There's Bessel functions, spherical and cylindrical, a Neumann function. And notice that all these functions, there are two different versions available or two different surfaces available, one for float and one for double, depending on the types you want to have. Okay, for the chrono library, dealing with time, um, this has some new rounding functions, round, floor, and ceiling, and also an absolute function to get durations. Next, ConstExpr. So why is everybody excited about ConstExpr? Because you can do more programming at compile time and have to do less at runtime. So every place you can use a ConstExpr is possibly an opportunity to make your code a little bit faster, especially doing anything computational-wise. So they've tried to make ConstExpr a lot stronger by providing a whole series of small fixes here. So there's more standard array functions will work with ConstExpr that didn't work before. There are free functions for range access that are now ConstExpr safe. Reverse iterator and move iterator are now ConstExpr friendly. Most functions from the chrono lib are now ConstExpr friendly, but not now. So <laughs> there's no way to know what the time now is during compile time. So that one kind of makes sense. Uh, specializations from the standard character traits, we talked about traits earlier, are now ConstExpr. No exception fixes. So standard vector and standard string now guarantee not to throw in a default constructor. and a move constructor and a constructor with an allocator. For all containers, move, assignment, and swap guarantee not to throw. So part of the reason that you might like this is that reallocating a vector of strings is now guaranteed to be faster. I'm sorry, vector of strings or a vector of vectors 
is guaranteed to be faster. Other types may still be slower, but this is definitely sped up those two or possibly common use cases. File system library. Okay, I have 60, <laughs> no, I have 167 slides. So we have about 47 left and there's already 817. I don't think I'm getting through those in 10 minutes or 13 minutes even. So Lloyd, I think you're going to get your wish. If you want to have me come back in November and finish this out, you think this is probably the stopping point. That works for me and we would love to have you back. I for one want to hear about files. <laughs> I've used it. It's wonderful. I have used Boost's version, <laughs> ah. which I assume is the same now. Right. So I have five slides in the file system library during which I give you a very high level overview. If I come back in November, I'll probably spend 30 slides on it because I was not happy with what I was able to say in only five slides. So look forward to November and you'll get a much more thorough introduction to the file system library than if I told you right now. Good. Any other questions? Thank you, Peter. I really enjoyed your presentation. I learned a lot. Yep. You're wonderful as usual. Thanks for listening, everybody. Okay. I guess at this point, um, we do have a little bit of a harder stop at this on this room than we in, mm -hmm. did in the past. They kind of expect us out by 830. Um, the reason for that is they're paying for the receptionist outside. <laughs> that, that is a little bit, some of the fringe benefits we get here. So um, we'll go with that. Uh, we will be back here next month. Um, we'll be next month. I'm not quite sure on that. We'll check that. But uh, yep. Thank you everyone for attending. And um, oh, the other one I was going to mention. Uh, at some point in the future, we will be bringing the pizza back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're kind of, I didn't know how many to expect, and it may or may not be next month, but it is coming. So. Cool. Oh, I missed some recordings. Yeah. People on the recording don't get pizza still. Yeah.